in this edition of WUCF Artisodes, an art exhibit that provides a hands-on experience. We're getting past that kind of classical sculpture feel and that taboo of not touching and bringing it into something more modern and more welcoming. And a local student whose musical talent seems endless. My favorite choice out of different career paths is definitely gonna be traveling the world to sing. It's all coming up on WUCF Artisodes. Most art exhibits include the warning, look but don't touch. A Winter Park Museum, however, is changing the rules. Normally, you come into a museum and you're always told not to touch art. But for this exhibit, we really wanted to encourage interaction. This is all about um, kinetic art, touching art, experiencing art in a different way. The Sight Unseen Sculpture Exhibit at the Palashik Museum. This is all modern interpretations of texture. So we're getting past that kind of classical sculpture feel and that taboo of not touching and bringing it into something more modern and more welcoming. Mr. Palashik suffered a stroke when he first moved to Winter Park, Florida. And because of that, that left him paralyzed on his entire left side of his body. So he had a unique challenge as an artist as well, learning how to sculpt again with one hand. So this sculpture exhibit is really celebrating people's different capabilities, and I think it's perfect here at the Palashik. Many of the exhibitors in this show are part of the Florida Sculptors Guild. When our group first started planning and thinking about what you know, we could create, we really had to wrap our head around it, you know, because it's like, wait, you're not going for what it visually looks like, you're going for what it's going to feel like. With the fingers, it's kind of like, oh, it's cool, but it's kind of creepy. There are actually 368 fingers involved. Those are people's castings of people's individual fingers. People are touching a sculpture. How about if the sculpture touches them back, and hence the fingers? It's like this creepy cool thing, like people want to touch it, but then they're not sure they want to touch it. But then they do. I'm known as the great lady because I do work based on manhole covers, and the blind people usually can't go down in the street and feel a manhole cover. In fact, most people don't. The city of Orlando manhole cover is really based on a site outside of the Orlando Museum of Art, Lock Haven Park. The t ancient bricks are right there in the parking lot, so that's a, that's a piece of their street right there. The Con Edison concert was started out with a paper casting of the Con Ed covers that are all over New York City. And then you press the different buttons and you get sound effects that talk about electricity, how important it is, who invented it. Who was known for lighting up our world? The answer is Thomas Alva Edison. So the Con Ed concert is its sound and its appreciation of electricity. A lot of my work is dealing with reusable materials and using them in a way that they were not originally designed to, to function. It was really challenging, I could say, as an artist because you want to like over explain things is the first things I thought of. It's all about touching. You got to be able to see through your fingertips. It is aluminum frame welded underneath and then there's 1,255 feet of garden hoses wrapped around this particular piece. The concept I've always thought should have been something sculpture should be able to do because it's a presence. So you should be able to touch these things. The fusing was how to do something that would, you could reuse. It's actually called upcycling, and this has bubble wrap because, again, it's textural. There's 100,000 turtles die a year from ingesting plastic bags. And at this particular exhibit, it was a great opportunity for people to actually be able to enjoy and interact and possibly learn. My mom is completely blind, so, and I've grown up with that, so I kind of have an idea of how she does things and how she starts to feel things. So I kind of know where people are going to feel first. and I just do a lot of doodles. And you know, some of them turn into like full-on drawings, and this happened to be one of them. 
but I wanted my mom to be able to, you know, interact with it. The ears and the, and the textures, um, some of them are very bumpy, some are smooth. Uh, it, it just, um, it, I, I can't imagine what this, what this must look like to a sighted person, but to uh, a blind person, I would uh, totally have this in my house because anybody can appreciate this, sighted or not. Knowing my mom can appreciate my art is, it's really great. It's, I mean, I'm a musician as well, and she can hear that. I've always doodled and I've always painted and I've always done art, but now she can appreciate that more and understand more of why I love art so much, and now she loves art too. It is kind of ironic to be blind and to have a daughter who's so into art. She does play music and do other things, which I can relate to her, but this was an area that we weren't able to fully connect. So I feel, I feel like now that I understand her art a little, a little better and her style a little bit better. It's been really rewarding to see blind people come into the museum and have a positive interaction. We wanted to take that energy and that passion that Mr. Plaszczyk had and bring it up to something that was relevant. So it was really amazing to see those people come through and experience it. As part of WUCF's American Graduate Initiative, Artisodes proudly honors our Student Artist of the Week. As we bring awareness to the dropout crisis and encourage Central Florida's children to succeed. I'm Jean-Marie Glazer. I'm a senior at Boone High School and I'm a cellist, a barbershopper, and an opera singer. My family moved down from Montreal in Quebec about 17 years ago. I've been playing with the Florida Youth Symphony Orchestra for 12 years. This is my 12th year. I actually hold the record for longest running member. What I love most about playing the cello is the chance to play in a 70 or 80 piece symphonic orchestra. We have all of these minds coming together with a single purpose. They say, all right, we're going to pick this masterpiece by some super genius in, from the past and we're going to perfect this thing and we're going to perform it and you're working together to make this gorgeous, gorgeous work of art, you know, the kind of, it's almost the voice of God coming down and penetrating the hearts of everyone you're playing for. It's, it's for everyone else who comes in and who enriches their lives with this experience that you get to give them, that you get to give them. I think it's a privilege. John marie is very special because he has played cello since a very young age, but he's also unique in that he has a very strong voice. I've gotten into opera now. I was able to sing the Nutcracker, an abridged version of the Nutcracker, in middle school, and that kind of gave me the bug for it. And eventually I stumbled on the Florida Youth Opera Theater. And so with them, I've been able to pick up on pieces from the Magic Flute, from Don Giovanni, from all these different opera pieces. And I've realized that it's something I really enjoy doing, and that I can see myself doing that all the time. So opera is what I'm sticking to. Let me call you, sweetheart, I'm in love with you. Let me hear you whisper that you love me too. I got into barbershop through my mother, actually. She was singing with the Sweet Adelines for a couple years and figured I'd enjoyed it. So at the beginning of this year, I was able to recruit couple of gentlemen and make a barbershop quartet. We call ourselves the Boone Barbershop Quartet because we love barbecue. I'm in love with you, with you. My favorite choice out of different career paths is definitely gonna be traveling the world to sing because I think it's, it's something a lot more intimate to sing to someone as opposed to play to someone. And I like to I want to remove any kind of disconnect that there might be between me and my audience. 
Artisodes congratulates Jean-Marie Glazer of Boone High School, our Student Artist of the Week. Kevin Mount has been dealt more than his fair share of life's challenges. He's a man of few words, but his art speaks volumes. My name is Kevin Mount. I am 21 years old and I love to paint. It is very interesting the way it happened with Kevin because he started painting and doing drawings since he was very little. And I didn't pay much attention to it, honestly, because I thought that all the kids do the same. But as he grew older and older and I continued visiting the same houses, there were no more pictures in the refrigerators anymore. And I was overwhelmed by the amount of paintings I had of Kevin. I like to use watercolors. Watercolors, I use more color than water because I like bright colors and I use more brushes. Paintings and brushes bright and colorful. Everything is that bright and colorful, I think. He never stopped painting. It was just art. He couldn't do anything else. He developed fine until he was three years old. I was at three years old that we got the first one, that it was asthma. Four came the viral LIGO. At five came the autism. At Seven, I believe, came the ulcerative colitis when he was 15 years old at Stanford. It came as a neuronal potassium blockage. What it means is that the immune cells, all the gates for the potassium are blocked. So his organs function without potassium. There's no cure for that. My focus was to do therapies and tutorials and all that kind of stuff, trying to fix Kevin. <laughs> and it took time for me to realize that I had to help Kevin to be Kevin, not to make him like somebody else. And when that happened, everything changed. He's always so happy. And he likes people to see his art. He likes to share his art. All his paintings are bright and colorful. That one is a Japanese girl that is blue and is black and red. And this one is a, a cat with blue face and his black spots and yellow eyes. And the next one we have is uh, the birds. All those parrots are a little bit big, so they have blue beaks and they're red. The other one is orange and they have purple and blue. All the animals come from the rainforest. They have all those bright colors. This one is the Joseph and the Amazing Tension Card Dream Code that we went to see at the Music Circus. It was amazing, so the show was great, so the, all the code is a little bit liner and it's all the rainbow colors. He always surprises me, every day surprises me. His car is just my passion, my connection with the world. He goes once a month to an infusion of uh, immunoglobulin to Sari Hospital. Um, and when he goes, he's hooked with needles and carrying all his equipment, doing the treatment and draws and paints with uh, markers in this board. And people love it because these people go for very, very heavy treatments. And it's just to relax them, just to see Kevin painting for them. I think it is a beautiful, beautiful thing to do. Other people appreciate Kevin Sarah. I think that that's the best gift. I'm very thankful because in a way, I've been taking care of him, but he's been raising me you know, to be a more complete person and appreciate little things. I know now what a passion is. That's the biggest lesson that Kevin had given me, is that I know what a passion is. A passion is not something that you like or you do it as a hobby. A passion is when you are consistent, determined, and you have the strength and the courage not to stop.
he wants to be an artist, which I think that he is already. <laughs> but in his mind, he knows, you know, that the world is waiting for him. My dream is to go to art school. To go to art school, you have to make sure you finish all your schoolwork, get that done. And then when you finish all the schoolwork, then you go to art school and then to college. I think that Kevin had a lot of purpose, not just the art. It's to make a change on people to appreciate the world different. And I think that he can make a difference in, in the world. I like to create art for everybody. I love creating. We're gonna do paint forever. Overcoming a life-threatening illness can change people in many ways. John Browning's brush with mortality helped him find a new balance between his day job and his passion for art. My, my day job is I'm a lawyer. I'm a practicing criminal defense lawyer. About 10 years ago, I took up plein air painting. I was a prosecutor first, then I became a defense lawyer, and I've been doing it for about 30 years. You know, I kind of practice law by day and slip in painting when I can. And then about eight years ago, I was really sick. Um, I had pancreatic cancer and um, decided, you know, I'm gonna do something else for a little while. I, and I, I can't really say that, you know, the cancer thing was the impetus because I had started painting uh, before I was diagnosed with cancer. And it, it wasn't like this great epiphany, you know, like, you know, stop and smell the flowers. But it really took the drive to practice law 14 hours a day was just gone at that point. I try to do something art related every day. Sometimes I don't make it. Um, sometimes if I'm not feeling well and there are times when I still don't feel well, then I won't do art for two weeks at a time. You know, people will stop by when you're painting outdoors and they'll say, this must be so relaxing. And it's relaxing in the way that taking a beating is relaxing. Um, it's hard work. Um, and if you're not focused, then you're um, playing. And not playing in a constructive way, you're, you're goofing around. It's not nearly as rewarding as when you're in the moment. Painting is, to me, a huge part of mining memories, is getting or not getting in touch, but staying in touch with lives past, with memories past, with family and friends and places. Um, I love painting um, the places I grew up. Uh, you know, I love painting, painting the Midwest. I love painting Ohio and Columbus. You know, it's, it's finding a connection and, and nursing that connection that painting is to me, I think. Continuance is an exhibit that displays the works of a father and son, each with distinctive styles of their own. I love the opportunity to show the poetics in life. The horizon and the landscape, the silhouette of the mountains, are really important to me, and I love the cosmos, I love space. Both of these artists are looking at how we experience the world through light and through our landscape and through our space. Both artists are giving us something that is really rooted in, in their own emotions and their own experiences, but it's also very intellectual. The title for the two combined one-person exhibits is Continuance, and it's about the dialogue between generations that is universal. By showing these two artists side by side and not necessarily next to each other in the same space is really giving our viewers the opportunity to experience these artists as individuals, but to also see where Colin has been inspired by his father. As a kid, I always loved light. 
and I use a lot of the similar methods and techniques that my father uses, especially material, acrylic, industrial found material. I'm making references to readings, to pieces of music, to thoughts, and they kind of fold in. They really help, I think, give a cue for the viewer if the work is a little hard. All of this is a little, at times, confusing. I mean, drawings, steel beams, standing on this shiny piece of metal that was inspired by the floor plate on our mass transit buses. If a person can walk in and realize this is a language, it's a visual language, that I'm really trying to speak to them. So one of my goals is to slow the viewer down, and that's by having them enter, and they look at it, and then right when they're about to walk away, they're like, wait, it's changing color? That's when I know that the piece is somewhat successful, and I'm hoping that that can translate to outside, so when they're just driving, they notice their surroundings, they just slow down. You approach each exhibit kind of in opposite ways. With Colin's work, you enter it, and it's immediately very emotive, and you come to the intellectual side after you've spent some time with the work, whereas Chuck's, you enter the gallery, and it's very structural, and it feels very industrial, but after you've spent some time with that work, then you really begin to get a sense of who he is and the emotion that's underlying his work. These materials, I feel, are my visual vocabulary to speak to the poetics in life. This is my aesthetic. This is what I consider beautiful. And I deal with connection. Connections, it could be something as simple as a handshake or an embrace. It can be the structures in buildings or doors and windows that lead from one thing to another. I want to simplify the design as much as I can. I don't want to emphasize the technology. I want to emphasize the light and the reactions that we have to the light, the calming effects, the meditative, the spiritual effects that light has on each of us. There's a, sometimes a lot going on, but I want the light to be the primary medium, not the design itself. I love drawing. I sit down and draw every day, but it's in black and white. It just speaks to me with clarity. Some people pray, some people meditate, some people jog or exercise. I draw every day. I've honed it down where color seems over the top emotionally. I'm trying to show the quiet, more still version of what I see in life. Art can motivate people to understand the world in different ways, to see the world in different ways to have us contemplate life. It becomes a gift of understanding, maybe in a nonverbal way, who you are, why you're here. That's all for this week on WUCF Artisodes. Thanks for watching. For more arts and culture, visit our website at wucftv.org slash artisodes, where you can find feature videos and more.